Let's pray. Gracious God, we lift up praises and thankfulness for the healing that's going on with both Johnny and Joe. We pray for all of us that are undergoing treatments and other kinds of recovery things that, uh, that you'll be guiding the hand of those so they'll get better as well. We lift up your name as the great physician and the great healer. Of course, we do that for physical things, but God, we also ask you to uh, come into and, and heal this hurting world. You know, we have all kinds of disagreements about why it happens or how it happens, but there's a lot of people suffering. A lot of people looking for food, a lot of people looking for work. Whatever the cause and whatever the way it is, God, we hope that you'll intervene and find ways for your kingdom to come about here on earth the way it is in heaven. The thing we pray for so often. We know that sometimes we fail you. We fall into the trap of being worldly. Sometimes we decide we're better than someone else or higher up the ladder or have a closer faith to you than someone else. And we ask you to forgive us when we confuse your message of love. So as we sing, bind us together, we ask you also, God, bind us together in the human family to be people of mercy and grace and love, regardless of the things that go on around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now this, this next song is, uh, I don't know how long it's going to go on. <laughs> we never know. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a short little song. It says, Jesus, remember me when I come into your kingdom. That's the, that's the words. Uh, and it's made to be one of those things where you just sort of get into a place of, of thinking about Jesus, remember me. Uh, so as uh, Leslie plays, we'll sing and see what happens. which is a ministry where we go into the prison for a while. And uh, 
we had a bunch of guys there that uh, we had six inmates with every three of us and so we fed them cookies and did ministry to them for three days. The only real difference between us and them was they got caught and we got to go home at night. Uh, but uh, we had a good time with them and we sang this song and it has some interesting words. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what they did when they get to the angel wings. But uh, Anyway, let's sing it and see what happens. You'll, you'll recognize this. sort of get into a trance with that and, and then I get to thinking I sure hope Jesus does remember me right that's why we're here right we want him to remember us so I'm going to read tonight from the gospel of Mark Joe you didn't know you led right into my message tonight but it's right there John said to him teacher we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us but Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink, because you hear bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the, their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So the reason I... I said that, you know, this you can picture this. Jesus is going around doing whatever Jesus does, and there's somebody else who's picked up the message down the road, and they're doing a similar message, and so the disciples say, wait a minute, he's not one of us. How can he be qualified? And there would be some people in AA that would say, oh, you got sober some other way. It's not real. 
there would be some people that said, hey, go, well, you go to that kind of a church. That kind of a church can't be the right church because I go to this kind of church. Jesus addresses that, I think, in this message where he says, look, if you're doing the right thing, it's the right thing. People asked me years ago, many years ago now, how you know you're an alcoholic? Well, there is no blood test. I mean, they can do a blood test to see if you've got a lot of alcohol in your blood, but that doesn't make you an alcoholic. In fact, it's one of the few diseases, and it is a disease, that you have to actually qualify yourself for. And to me, it's always been the same as our Christian story, is that, you know, there's really nobody that can say you're saved. There's nobody that can say you've met all the criteria to get to heaven. That's a story that's between you and God. And there's no other way around that. It's just between you and God. Now, we like to do it in community. We like to get together and praise God together. We like to sing those songs and do those kind of things. But that it's, it's not like I can get there for you. I know people that decided to quit drinking because they didn't like what it did to their body. They never drank again. They don't consider themselves alcoholic, but they don't drink. I know other people that think they can manage it. And I know a whole lot of people think they can manage sin. And I want to tell you, you can't manage it. It doesn't matter how hard you try, whatever you do, you're probably going to sin today. And God knows that. God's not happy about it. God doesn't want you to keep sinning, but God also knows that it's about progress, not perfection. In other words, can you look in the rearview mirror and see that you've made any movement in your spiritual life? Are you in a better place today with God than you were five years ago? Are you in a better place with God today than you were yesterday? And do you believe that that can continue to grow? Wesley described that. He, he talked about grace three ways. He said there was prevenient grace, which actually his word was preventing grace. That's the grace that you had in your life before you knew it. How many of you have said there, but by the grace of God go I? That's what a lot of those guys in that prison said. A lot of them, they, they were no different than you or me. They just got caught. How many of us have looked in the rearview mirror and said, man, God rescued me a number of times. And Wesley would have called that preventing grace, the grace that goes on in your life before you know it. And then there comes a day when you realize it. You kind of hit you upside the head and says, wait a minute. Huh. If God was doing that for me, what can God do for me if I get in line with God? And we call that justifying grace. If you've ever used a word program, you know what justifying is, right? Where you click on the little thing and it lines all the words up. You can justify to the left or justify to the right or justify to the center. And what God is trying to get us to do is to justify to the center. And a lot of people, a whole lot of people in the world think if I've accomplished that, if I've, if I've either gone to the front of a church somewhere and, and said a prayer and given Christ my life to Christ, then I'm justified and everything's good. Wesley, John Wesley would have said that's only the beginning of the story. Once you realize it, then your life has to change in line with what you believe and see. And he called that sanctifying grace. Years ago, there used to be a TV show called Jag. Anybody ever watch Jag? Well, you should. They play in the replays all the time. But anyway, it, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lady in there who's a recovering alcoholic. She had a horrible growing up period with her dad. And the, the, they notify her that her dad is dying from his alcoholism. And he says, you really need to go and see her. And she said, well, I don't want to go see her. And finally, she acquiesces and she goes to see him. And, and there's a, a priest sitting there with him. And, and he says, you know, you just need to forgive your dad. And she said, I don't even want to talk to my dad, let alone forgive him. What makes you so sanctimonious? And he just smiled and looked at her and said, I'm just trying to be sanctified. And that's a goal we have, really. We may not know what to call it. We may not have known that word. But sanctification is what we're looking for. It's that, that uh, cleansing that we talk about when we say, you go to see Jesus at the, uh, at the heavenly gate, wherever it is. And, and we go there and, and the prosecutor comes out and lists all the stuff we've done in our life, right? And, and it's not all good. And, and, and then Jesus comes along and through Jesus, we are sanctified. We're made lily white. We're made clean. And I think God created that scenario on purpose for us so that, that we can look forward to a time when we can be washed clean. 
And, and it's only Christ that can do that. So this scripture, you know, this follows the one from, the, I don't know if I used it here last week, but on the, in this group of scriptures was when the disciples were saying, which one of us gets to be on your right? You know, we spend so much time trying to think about, well, I got to do this to get to heaven. What if we're being um, guided right now? And what if heaven is what we see right now? What if we have work to do to bring heaven for somebody else? What if the people that are hurting can be helped by something we do? So I think it's important, you know, for those of us in the program, especially to stand up every now and then and say, by the grace of God, the fellowship and, and, and God, I've got 32, 34, 36 years, but we need to not forget how great it is for that person that has 24 hours. What a big deal it is for that person to have 24 hours sober. And, and because all of us were there in our lives sometime. And, and so the same thing is true in our sinful lives when we look at others and say, man, they're sure living a sinful life. Well, yeah, there we were too. Now, ours might not, we might not have murdered anybody, but we sure as heck could probably talk bad about somebody or we've told a little white lie sometime in our life, maybe more often than we want to talk about. And, and I'm going to tell you, when Jesus gets to count sins, a little white lie and a big black lie are the same. Sin is sin. It's fallen away from what God wants us to be, what God wants us to do. And God created us, I believe, with a plan for us to be a human family like that song we sang, bind us together to be unified in the Spirit. And even in Jesus' time when this, <laughs> this group of disciples is small compared to now, they're being cliquish and clannish and saying, wait a minute, he's not one of us. How many times have we done that in some other way in our life? I was watching a, a law and an old Law and Order show this afternoon after we got into town, and there was a little boy that, that uh, did some dastardly things, and he said he did them because he saw it on TV, and they said it was a good thing to do. And, and the, the defense attorney said, "Well, that was the excuse." Well, I mean, look, I, I watched Superman years ago when he was in black and white, and he had a thing around his neck, and I tied a towel around my neck. But you know what? I couldn't fly. In fact, I fell when I jumped off the chair. And Mighty Mouse could fly, and I can't fly, and, and, and you know, those other guys could do magical things. Batman can do stuff. Superman, whoever it is, there's a difference between fiction and reality. And the reality is that we live in a world where there's a desperate need for a group of people to take the high road, to use, show love, mercy, and grace rather than judgment and punishment about everything we do. There was another show, I don't remember when I was watching it, and over the last couple of days, and there was a guy that was a, a serial killer, and so the police officer decided it was uh, on her task to take him out. And the community and many of the policemen were happy about it. And the reality is that murder is murder, whether you're murdering a bad guy or a good guy. I mean, these lines are really pretty clear when it comes to the Bible and what the scriptures say. I know we, we like we like it when somebody gets what's due. You know, we like that. But I'm not sure that's our task. It's, it's crystal clear to me as I read more and more of this book that God says the judgment's up to him. And he'll take care of it. And if I really believe that God is who God is, that God is the one that created all this magnificence of the universe, that they can make that little star Polaris up there stay in the same place all the time when everything else moves. You're looking for a higher power, look for it there. That kind of a God that can, in the midst of all of the stars and the planets, can set something into place and it stays put. In spite of gravity, in spite of all of the other things that we know in the natural world, that star is always there. Actually, it would be that way, because that's no one thing. It's, you'll see it later tonight. It's clear. You can see it. I, I, uh, my wife, Kathy, messes around. She takes astro pictures and stuff. And, and so I, I know very little about any of this. I, when I was a Boy Scout, I learned how to know where the Big Dipper was. But... Uh, but, you know, it is a phenomenal thing to see the pictures of what's going on in this magnificent universe around us. And if you don't think that there was a God, then how in the world could something like that happen? That kind of a God is the kind of God that cares about you and me. 
It's that kind of a God that cares whether we are kind or not. And that's the same God that, that talks through Jesus Christ here when he says, look, if you're doing a good thing, that's a good thing done through, from God. And we need to realize that there's so many good. Uh, one of my friends, preacher friends says, you know, sin abounds. We could all agree with that. He said grace abounds more. Whatever level of sin there is, there's more grace. And we're God's instruments of grace in this kingdom that we live in right now. We're the ones that are supposed to be living into this grace. We're the ones. But what sometimes we find ourselves finding things that, that interfere. So Jesus gets really graphic. He says, look, if your hand's causing you to sin, cut it off. If your foot's causing you to sin, cut it off. If your eye's causing you to sin, pick them out. It'd be better to be blind than it would to go to hell. And the reality is that the world is more interested in sending us that direction than it is that direction. The world is not a godly place right now. Now, I don't think God has abandoned us in Southeast Harris County or in Texas or in the United States. I think God is with us as God always has been. But I think our awareness of God has dropped off significantly. Think about the things, I mean, some of y'all are my age, some are younger, but when I was growing up, they didn't put some TV shows on TV until after 9 o'clock at night because they assumed that most children would be in bed by then. But now we have cable TV, it's on all the time. You can watch people murdered, slaughtered, raped, and pillaged 24-7. And we're apparently okay with that because we buy, the, we buy the stuff that they sell in the commercials. We pay for the cable service. We do the stuff that keeps it going. And so we want to point fingers and blame them, but really we need to go look in the mirror. Because if we want to make a change, we have to be a part of the change. Uh, He's not a great biblical image at all, but Michael Jackson has a great song about the man in the mirror. And he says, if you want to make a change, look in the mirror. And I think that's really where we are. It's what James said when he said, you look in the mirror and you see, and you see who you are, but then you walk away. It's what Paul says when he says, you look in the mirror, but you see only dimly. We look in the mirror and we see what we want to see, not what God wants us to see. And there are just certain things going on in this world that we shouldn't support. And I could go into them, and some of you would agree, and some of you would disagree. We'll leave that for a different day. But, but I think the Scripture to me here, when it starts to say that there's another guy over here, and he's teaching about Jesus, but he's not doing it exactly the same way we do, so we should disqualify him, really rings true for the way we are about different denominations or different religions. And I, you know... I got to know that the, the, the Buddhist, the, the Hindu religion was around long before Christianity. And they were seeking God. The Native Americans, they've all got a creation story. They've all been seeking after God. God has been the target of every generation, of every civilization. And we want to sit there and say, we've got it right? I don't know. But what we need to do is we need to honor whatever somebody else is and let them be wherever they are, but be a reflection of the Christ that we know about. You know, the scripture says there'll be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Now, some people see that as a day when there'll be judgment. Oh, finally, you're going to have to kneel and, and bow. And I see it the other way. I see that the light's going to come on and people will realize that God is God that Christ is the incarnation of God, and that love, mercy, and grace are the way to the future. Way more so than all the things we'd like. If I was in charge for a day, I'd screw it up. And most people that are in charge for a day do. But we need to also understand those same people, are, whatever way they reflect it, they're doing whatever they believe probably is the best thing they can do. I hope that's true. And sometimes they're not doing it the same way I do. I know that, that uh, over the years I've had a couple of encounters, maybe more than a couple, with people that uh, were recovering of sorts. I remember this one guy that told me, he said, well, he, he was he had a really big job and he had crashed and burned. He had, they found him like drunk at his desk. <laughs> and uh, so he, he got in the program and he got sober and 
he, he called me aside one day and he said, well, you know, I, I figured out that, that uh, I really didn't have a drinking problem. I had a drink management problem. He said, if, if I'm with my wife and we're in the hot tub, you know, I can have a glass of wine. And I said, well, that's cool. If that works for you, works for you. Now, move the clock forward about three or four years. And he had another important job. And he had an affair with somebody in the job. Now, this guy really did love his wife. But he, that glass of wine, and I told him, in fact, that night that he told me about he could have a glass of wine with his wife in the hot tub, I said, that's fine. When you start having a glass of wine with somebody besides your wife in the hot tub, call me. Well, that's what happened. And I think when we start to think we've got it handled is when we need to start turning it over to God. And that maybe that's the reason that, that I picked that Jesus Remember Me song here tonight, because that's the thing. You don't have to be a musician. We don't even, I mean, we can do that anywhere you are. You can be, but when you start to be into one of those places where you're starting to feel like you're on shaky ground, then, you know, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Those are important words. Will he remember who you are, where your heart is, when you come into his kingdom? And here's the reality. We're in His kingdom right now. It's not a future tense thing. God's kingdom is happening right around us right now. And I have experienced this in recent days. There seems to be this need. We used to call it revival. See, I'm not sure it's revival because I'm not sure that there's, there's probably three generations of people out there that need to be vived, not revived. They don't know who God is. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what a difference it makes to turn their life and will over to Jesus Christ. They don't know the difference between this being right and this being wrong. If they don't think they're wrong, then you can't talk to them about it. And so we don't need to sit there and try to convince somebody that doesn't think they're wrong, they're wrong. We need to be an example for them what it is to be different. I think I've told you all this before, but my therapist friend that suggested to me on September the 1st, 1989, that I not drink anymore, she knew me pretty well. If she'd have said, I think you got an alcohol problem, I'd have been resistant. You didn't wear your resist t-shirt tonight, but I'd have been resistant. <laughs> Instead, she said to me, I think you make better decisions when you don't drink. Why don't you try not drinking for a while? Same person told me I ought to get off a of white refined sugar, white bleached flour, uh, caffeine. Hey, I'm an alcoholic, right? So if you tell me I don't need that stuff, I'm just going to stop it all today. But then I get sick. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't work that way. You're supposed to taper off, change slowly. Uh, I don't expect God to just come in and, and go poof and we all go home acting different. But I think that maybe we can have an awareness that, that through... Uh, an awareness maybe that we are standing on holy ground not just wherever we go but where we are and wherever we are there are angels that's the little angel wings that we put for the prisoners and they all were into it boy they were those old guys <laughs> they were all putting their little fingers up we're standing on holy ground there's angels all around what a gift it was for them to realize that in their circumstance the angels were looking after them and they're looking after you as well So, you know, James, in his letters, he says things about the tongue being a problem. Jesus here gets more graphic and says if your hands or your feet or your eyes are causing you to sin. You'll all remember Jimmy Carter said if you lust in your heart, it's just like doing the real thing. So we, we don't have to, we have an abundance of sin. But we need a bigger abundance of grace. So rather than pointing out other people's failures, I, my third grade school teacher, I'll never forget her, she pointed at us and said, when you point that one finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at yourself. And the problem usually is here. I've learned over the years I can pray for other people, and when I do, my heart changes. I can pray for people I don't like, my heart changes. I can pray for people that are living a lifestyle I don't like, my heart changes. My prayers seem to affect me more than they do those that I pray for. And I think sometimes we need to pray that we can have God's heart. We can look around our community and we can say, what are the things that go around us right now that are breaking Jesus' heart? Could you make a list of things that are happening in our community that break Jesus' heart? 
I mean, I could make a list, you know, Texas payday loans, uh, you know, a lot of things, MasterCard, Visa, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things I think that are breaking Jesus' heart. And I'm sure each of us can have a list too. And it's those things, once we identify them, that we can live toward and make sure that we're using our hands and our feet and our eyes to be the heart, hands, and feet of Jesus, not of the will that we have to get it done our way. Those are a few things that come out of this scripture for me today. I want to read this quickly and then we'll move on. Wesley talked about money. And I think money is one of the issues that we really deal with. And he had a thing that said, do all the good you can, uh, do no harm, do all the good you can, stay in love with God. And he's well uh, attributed with having said, gain all you can. He doesn't mean to get rich. He means gain all you can so you can help others. So here it is. Wesley says, gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. It's often misunderstood because we need to understand that, you, that, that Wesley have means economize. Christians should, if possible, be gainfully employed, ethically earning as much as possible. We economize by not spending more on ourselves than necessary for a modest, useful, disciplined life. We can thus contribute liberally, giving all we can to the poor and for ministry. Wesley knew that running a business may require capital, so he was not opposed to accumulating money for this purpose. But any wealth beyond what is necessary for ethical business and modest living belongs to the poor. We rob God if we do not give it away. Our money is not really ours, it rightfully belongs to God and the poor. We're stewards, Christian disciples. <coughs> the way to put that in, in local language. If a tube of toothpaste costs $4.50 at Kroger, but you could buy the same one at the Dollar General Store for $2.10, then you should buy it for $2.10, but not so that you can save the $2.40, so that you could give it away. That was the way he, he took the same salary, I think it was 85 pounds, for his whole life. He probably made millions, but he gave it away. And so what I know is that, you know, over my life I've figured out that when I start to put God first and I give to God through God to do things for the community, then my life gets better as well. And I think that's the promise as we get closer to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, the time we have together. We pray for those that are traveling and for those that are sick. We pray for Michael and for Johnny and we continue to pray for Joe. We pray for physical healing, but most of all, God, we pray for us to be at peace with you so that we can sit there and sing that song, Jesus, remember me until I come into your kingdom for hours. Because our focus is to be seen and heard and recognized by you. The others, they may not think so much of us. But what difference does it make if we're on your side and you've got our backs? Tonight as we gather and we come to your table, we pray that this grape juice and this bread will come for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we come up here and accept it into our hands, we once again realize that you are the King of Kings and that through you, not only do we gain salvation, but we hope to, to be a part of the salvation for the whole world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Leslie, you probably want to come first. Friends, the table is prepared. Uh, we have a, the offering is in the back in a basket. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings there. The bucket that's up here will be contributing toward uh, flood relief as we go uh, for people in Louisiana that are suffering. Well, I guess in other places too, wherever our will goes. The table is prepared. Come as you will.
table where heaven and earth meet. Now we're called to go out into the world and be the body of Christ. Go in peace. Amen.